Uh, my name is Nayaswami Pranaba, and this is Nayaswami Anandi, and we're very happy to have you all here, especially any of you that are guests or visitors for the first time. It's a joy to have you, and a special welcome to those on the internet as well. This week's reading from Rays of the One Life by Swami Kriyananda with commentaries on the Bible and Bhagavad Gita. The topic is, Self-Effort too is Needed. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramhansa Yogananda. These past weeks we discussed the need for balancing self-effort with receptivity to divine grace. Both are important in the spiritual life. Passive dependence on grace hasn't the magnetism to attract grace. Boastful self-confidence, however, which closes itself off from the highest divine power, is shallow, brittle, and given life's many uncertainties, susceptible to ultimate failure. There is a story in the Bible that illustrates the need to put forth personal effort so as to draw magnetically on the divine power. The story occurs in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 8. But as he went, the crowds nearly suffocated him. Among them was a woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years, and who had derived no benefit from anybody's treatment. She came up behind Jesus and touched the edge of his cloak. As a result, her hemorrhage stopped immediately. Who was it who touched me? Jesus asked. When everybody denied it, Peter remonstrated. Master, the crowds are all round, pressing you on every side. But Jesus said, Somebody touched me. I felt power going out from me. When the woman realized that she had not escaped notice, she came forward trembling and fell at his feet and admitted before everyone why she had touched him, adding that she had been instantaneously cured. Daughter, Jesus said, it is by your faith that you have been healed. Go in peace. Self-confidence and self-effort are necessary as the ignition of a car is necessary to the motor. Of what use the ignition, however, if the motor itself will not work? Wise is he who recognizes the real power in the universe and guides his life by that supreme power. As it says in the Bhagavad Gita in the ninth chapter, to those who meditate on me as their very own, ever united to me by incessant worship, I make good their deficiencies and render permanent their gains. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. Welcome, everyone. I'd like to begin with a reading from Whispers from Eternity, a book of prayers and poems by Paramahansa Yogananda. This is a prayer called, Satisfy My Soul Hunger. O pervading spirit, the breeze of thy inspiration has removed every cloud from my heart. The firmament of my mind is now clear. Purified, I behold only thee everywhere. The sunshine of thy joy spreads rapidly to the farthest shores of my being. After long ages of hunger, I feed on thy light. By thy grace and by my constant wakefulness in thee, may this joy be mine forever, forever, and forever. So this morning's topic, self-effort too, is needed. I thought I would begin with a story to explain where the two, T-O-O, -O, relates to, lest you think that this is a movie sequel or something. <laughs> so this is a strange story that a friend of mine told me last week, and I listened to it again um, over the internet. But I hope you will 
be able to find the inspiration in it that I did, because I began to meditate on it quite a bit after I heard it. Um, it seems that in Butte, Montana, there was a huge copper mine. It was a copper mine that supplied like one-third of the world's copper. And it went out of business sometime in the 20th century. And there was a huge pit next to it. And that pit began to fill up with water. But that water was running through the copper mine and actually was not water. It actually was sulfuric acid. So you had this lake, a reddish sort of a lake that looks like very toxic. Anyway, sometime in the 1990s, about 340 snow geese landed in that, what they thought was a lake. Naturally, they drank a little bit of the, what they thought was water. And naturally, in the morning, there were 350 dead snow geese floating on the surface of the lake. Well, there were two biochemists living near that area. And they were trying to avoid that toxic site as much as possible. But at some point, someone brought them uh, like this green stuff that had been growing in the lake. But it would not be possible for anything to grow in the lake because it was sulfuric acid. And so these biochemists became very interested in what could grow in that lake. And it turned out that there were hundreds of different um, bacteria. And it turns out that many of these bacteria are actually providing medicinal cures for various ailments. So that was one item. Then the next thing that happened to this couple, and they were the ones being interviewed on the radio, is that somebody brought them some, a hunk of this sort of black substance. And there were many of these sort of things floating in this toxic lake. And they said, what is this? And so they began to study this substance, this black substance, and it turned out that this substance was actually absorbing the toxins from the lake. Now, they knew that in biology there are these natural substances that absorb toxic materials, but they can usually only absorb about 10%. These black things were absorbing about 80% of this material, of this toxicity. So then they began to explore what was this bacteria that formed these black things. And I hope you will pardon my language when I say this, but that they found only one match for the bacteria in that, um, the black stuff, and it came from the rectums of snow geese. Okay, so we have this very interesting situation. And what I began to meditate on is healing. And the wisdom and power of this planet and all of life to pull, to draw healing, to create healing out of the most strange and unusual ways. And what a powerful force it is that God's healing is just flowing to us at all times in these sometimes very, very unusual ways. Um, so I'm just going to backtrack a little because some of you are new here. In the Indian teachings, we talk about God as Satchitananda, ever conscious, ever existing, ever new bliss. When I was studying religion in grade school and junior high, um, I wanted to be religious, but there were too many missing pieces. And one of the missing pieces was the link up between life and God. And when the Indian scriptures talked about the fact that God, this infinite, ever-existing bliss, became the world, suddenly all the lights went off and I just started to get very, very filled with joy at this concept. And so we see here in this, in this strange story, the earth expressing the wisdom and the, the existence and the power of God to heal itself. So this power is flowing all the time. And the masters, the saints, the ones who are united to the awareness, 
We too are Satchitananda, but they know. They're aware of themselves as Satchitananda. They want to heal everyone. They are not just picking out the ones that they like. They, their healing is flowing to everyone. Someone said to Yogananda once, bless me that I never leave this path. And Yogananda said to him, I give that blessing to everyone. And yet, how many hundreds of people, thousands of people have come to his path and left it? It's not his lack of blessing. It's our ability to receive. So this brings us to the wonderful reading of self-effort to is needed. And we come to the story of the woman who had the hemorrhage for 12 years. So this woman had to be weak. She had not, could not have like a lot of energy at that point. She'd lost a lot of blood. And yet, there were these crowds around Jesus. It said that he was being smothered by the crowds. She got herself up, probably from her bed, and made her way through those crowds, and made her way, despite the people suffocating him, she made her way up to him and was able to touch the hem of his garment. So what we're seeing here, as Swami's referring to, we have to raise our energy level to receive those blessings of God. This woman put out a tremendous amount of willpower to do what she did, to be able to get near to him. So we have to get on the wavelength. God is giving the blessings all the time, but we have to get on the wavelength so that we can receive them. And part of that wavelength is energy. A story that I've always gotten a kick out of uh, that um, is such a great example of energy happened uh, with Yogananda, whom we call Master, and uh, happened in Encinitas. Two of his first disciples in this country, Dr. Lewis and Dr. Lewis's wife, Mildred, had moved from Boston and were now living in Encinitas with Master. And Master took a group of the disciples out into the countryside, as he liked to do, just to relax and enjoy nature's beauty. And on that outing, uh, one of his friends gave him a huge watermelon. So they were driving home with a huge watermelon. They'd been out in nature all day, and it was dark by the time they got home. It was getting late. And Mildred is sitting there thinking, I wonder what he's going to do with that huge watermelon. She said, I soon found out. So he told all the disciples to go out and energize on the front lawn and then to come to the kitchen. And in the kitchen, he said, we're going to make watermelon rind pickles. And here's what we do. First, we scrub the watermelon then we peel the watermelon, then we pull off the rind and we cut it in very small pieces. We make a brine, we cook it in the brine, and then we take it out of that brine, we make another brine, we cook it in another brine, and then we cook it in a third brine. Okay, it's a rather time-consuming project, especially to start at night. And so, so they're starting on the project and they've got the watermelon peeled and they're starting to work on it. And Mildred looks up, and she realizes that all the other disciples have quietly left the room. (laughs) And there's only two people left, her and Master. And he's explaining to her the next steps of the process, and the next steps of the process, and the next steps. And then he says, I'm going to bed now. (laughs) You You can finish the project. Now, Mildred was not really a very docile sort of a person. So she was there for a few minutes, and then she stormed down to her bedroom, and she said to Dr. Lewis, I'm not going to stay up all night making these pickles. And Dr. Lewis looked at her calmly, and he said, I think you better do what your guru asked you to do. So, docile or not, she decided that he was right, and so she went back and spent the rest of the night finishing the project as Master had asked her to do. But the very interesting thing is at the end of that project, she said she never, ever was bothered by fatigue again. So there was a blessing for her. But in order to receive that blessing, she had to raise her energy level. And that's what she did. So being willing, whatever it is, whatever it is, it's an opportunity to put out energy. And that in itself is a blessing for us. 
Now, if we think back to the woman who was healed and she's made her way close to Jesus, do you think she was thinking, grabbing hold of him, heal me, heal me, I want you to fix me, I want, I need, I want. I don't think so. I think that's what all the other people were doing who were crowding around Jesus, is I need, give me, give me, give me. I think she was instead reaching up to his level, being on his wavelength. God is not on the wavelength of give me, give me, give me. He's on the wavelength of loving receptivity. I know who you are. I want to be one with you. I want to feel your love. She may not at that moment have been thinking of her illness at all, but only of her great desire to touch the master and to be near him. So I wanted to share something really beautiful about that wavelength and how do we get on that wavelength of receptivity. And it's something that was written by Sister Gyanamata, who was, uh, Yogananda said, his most advanced woman disciple. And she was a person who had a whole litany of physical illnesses. Uh, and it took up like two paragraphs of, to describe her illnesses. And they were painful illnesses. And yet Master said what he prized about her life was that he never saw pain in her eyes. And this is why. This is what she wrote to a devotee who was having a problem with physical suffering. One answer will cover all your questions. Turn to God and fill your consciousness with the realization of his perfection. Let your weakness be dissolved in the worshipful thought of his strength. It is not necessary to explain things to God, for he knows your needs before you speak and is more ready to give than you are to ask. When you meditate, turn away from everything except the one absorbing thought of his overshadowing presence. In this way, you will become receptive and healing will flow through body, mind, and soul. So we have to let go of what we need, what we think we have to have, and, and attune to this presence. Um, I had an experience in the 1980s that was very, very interesting and might explain this in an interesting way. Um, I was having pain in my uh, leg, and I didn't know why. It was sharp, intermittent pains for a number of years, and they began to get sharper and and more frequent and so on. And at a certain point, we found out that it was a lump in the leg, which turned out to be a a growth that was uh, benign, but we didn't know that at the time. And so I had to have the CAT scan and the MRIs and all that sort of stuff. And as I went through that process, something interesting happened. Uh, I stopped having intermittent pain. I started having constant pain, and it was more pain. And so as we were going through that whole process and then deciding, you know, how you find surgeons and all that sort of stuff, the pain was constant. And then one day, a striking thought came into my mind. And the thought was, God is giving this to you as a blessing, Now, the especially interesting thing that happened after that was that the pain stopped being constant and it went back to being intermittent. And so I reflected on that and it seemed like, oh, that was a miracle. You had this thought, it was a miracle. But I don't think it was all miracle. I think what it was is that as soon as I knew, oh, there's something in my leg, I wonder what's wrong with my leg. Is this going to be serious? Am I going to have to have surgery? You know, on and on and on my attention went to my leg. And perhaps because it was a nerve and nerves are very sensitive or because my muscles maybe were involuntarily tensing at the thought, I was squeezing that growth on the nerve and there was more pain. And when I had this thought of God and relaxing, hmm, leg relaxed, consciousness relaxed, less pain. So I think this is like a metaphor for what Gyanamata is talking about. When we're thinking about, oh, I'm so little and I'm so 
weak and I'm so in need, we tense up and we become more little and more weak and more in need. And when we, we drop that thought and we think of God's greatness, we relax and we feel it and we feel less of the suffering. Um, a few, many, actually several years ago, Mary Kretzman, who heads up our healing prayer ministry, sent out a very interesting study that was done. <clears throat> you probably have heard of Lourdes in France, where St. Bernadette found a healing spring. And many thousands of people visit Lourdes every year with physical ailments, asking for healing. And only a small, but significant, but still a small percentage are actually physically healed. And someone decided to interview those people who had received those miraculous physical healings and asked them the question, what were you thinking about when you were healed? <clears throat> and their answer was important. They all said, I was praying for someone else. I was praying for someone else. Their thoughts were not on, I want, I need, give me. But rather, here I am in this sacred place, feeling these divine blessings. My beloved friend needs healing. Please, God, help her. And it opened them to receive divine healing. It put them on the wavelength of divine healing. That's what God is doing. God is giving. God is sending love and blessings. And when we are giving and sending love and blessings, we're on his wavelength. And he fills us with that. I was thinking that, I was thinking about the image of prayer. And, I, and we've certainly all done it, but when you think about it on a certain level, it is a little embarrassing to sort of stand there and go, God, here I am, just the way I am, and I want you to fix my situation. I want you to send me the money that I need. I want you to send me the healing I need. I want you to send the relationship that I need. I'm going to stay right here, and you send it to me. Now, mind you, we've all been in those places where that's the only thing we can think of to do. And if it's the only thing you can think of to do, it's a great thing to do. It's like the best thing you can do. But what Sister Gyanamata, again, same source, said, which has always been such a powerful statement for me. She talked about a time in her life when she was, something was coming to her that she really didn't want. Some, she knew it had to come into her life, some terrible karma, and she knew she couldn't stop it. And she said she prayed inwardly, what is the prayer God will listen to? And the prayer she prayed was, change no circumstance of my life change me. Do you see how that really gets to what we really want anyway? If we don't have money or we don't have health or we don't have whatever it is we think we need, yes, we want it, but more than that, wouldn't we like to have what it is that would help us either get it or find joy in how we exactly are, how we could get closer to God? It really doesn't matter the other stuff. What we really want is personal transformation, personal freedom. And that's what that prayer leads us to. And that leads us to the Gita quotation, which I have here again, which I'm going to read again. Because this is, I think, one of my favorite Gita readings. And if not my very favorite, it's one I repeat parts of it to myself frequently, but I'll read it to you. Meditate on me as your very own, united to me by incessant worship. I will, this is the part that I always say to myself, I will fulfill your deficiencies and render permanent your gains. Okay. So who doesn't have deficiencies in one way or another? And to think that God will fill them. He's promising us that he will fill them. If we will keep our minds meditating on him, praying to him. There's a beautiful story from the life of Teresa of Avila, uh, who made a lot of 
revolutionary changes in the world of um, monasteries. And these changes were not very popular among the uh, people who were doing monasteries in the way that they felt was comfortable. She was trying to make monasteries much more monastic, <laughs> much, more, um, renunciate, much more renunciation as part of it. And so they, um, they decided they would bring charges against her to the Inquisition. And they were false charges, but it didn't matter. The Inquisition was so awful that anything could happen to you if the Inquisition decided that you were, you know, they thought you were guilty or they thought it was more convenient. If they found you guilty, they could do all kinds of terrible things to you. So they brought St. Teresa in to the Grand Inquisitor, and her accusers were there, and I assume somebody must have been there to speak for her, because St. Teresa stood there and said not one word in her defense. She looked at the Grand Inquisitor, and the Grand Inquisitor was scowling at her with a great intensity. But she didn't look at him. She looked above him. And she saw Jesus Christ there. And Jesus Christ was looking at her and smiling very reassuringly. And then he was scowling at the Grand Inquisitor, and he was scowling at her accusers. And she just went into rapture. And that was sort of the last she knew about what was going on. And when she came out of that... Now the Grand Inquisitor was smiling at her and scowling at her accusers. And he said, the charges against you are completely false. I'm going to bring punishment against these people who've brought false charges against you. So it was her only defense. She had nothing, no defense, but she knew that God would take care of her if she just simply absorbed her mind in God. So this, this quotation from the Gita that says, I will fulfill your deficiencies, and the com combined with the quote from, from the Bible, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. This is really all that the disciple needs. This is the, this is the secret of Ananda. This is how we exist totally and completely. Um, uh, Ananta was talking about this last weekend, but, um, you know, it's the more that you know about the early days of Ananda, now you sit here in this nice building and it's so successful and it seems so wonderful, but the more you know about those early beginnings, you realize that was really all we had. Seeking God, meditating on God, thinking of God incessantly, and then Master, who had the plan for communities, who has the ability to send healing and transformation to all people everywhere, he, he sent what we needed to Ananda, and he can send us whatever it is we need in our lives, whatever it is we need in our lives. If we remember, keep our minds on him, bring your mind here, know that the presence of God, the Divine Mother, Jesus Christ, whoever it is that you pray to, know that that presence wants to heal you in every way, wants to liberate you and offer yourself into that presence. Um.